I want to say just turn about anywhere. Uh, This whole subject is all through the scriptures, but we'll start with the book of Daniel. We need to put, I told you, there's going to be a lot of pieces, so we're going to each passage, putting the pieces together. We saw Romans 11, God's not through with Israel. We've seen um, Jeremiah 30, that, that he is talking about bringing them back in the land, and what he's going to do to bring them back in the land. It mentions the latter days. It mentions David. We're, we'll, we'll probably see, I started to go to Ezekiel 37, 38, 39. We will have to go to them. So read ahead. Um, if we get there today, we will uh, try to get there. If we're not, that's fine. you got the Valley of Dry Bones, and then you've got the introduction to Gog and Magog. And notice when you get to chapter 39, in case, now, chapter 38, he tells you it's the latter days. Chapter number 39, if you're reading ahead, uh, like, like we should be in Ezekiel, you're going to see a phrase in there, evermore. So, he's talking about a kingdom that's everlasting. So, that's not happened yet, right? So, you know that's future. Little key words like that as you're reading will help you understand whether it's something that's happened in the past, because some prophecy's already been fulfilled. So pay attention to the wording of um, what's said there. I, and I'll say this, because you look at Nebuchadnezzar's image, and you look at the kingdoms that come from Nebuchadnezzar, you know some of those kingdoms are already passed. And we're, you can tell where we're at with that image. I need to go over that image, but my focus right now is on the nation of Israel. I don't want to get off track. One of these days, we need to... I've gone through that image before at this church and when we were in the park. I draw like a stick figure because I'm a horrible draw, but I usually, uh, a horrible artist. I usually have Micaiah draw for me because he can draw a little better than me. But we've gone through that image. We'll have to go through some of those prophecies, but keep in mind... I'm not covering everything. There's no way for me to cover everything. What I'm trying to narrowly focus in on is that nation of Israel in particular. Okay? Because it's very important. So, we have one, two, three, four, five passages that I need to discuss today. I'm not going to read the whole passages. I'm going to focus on Matthew 24 when it's all said and done. That's where we're going to really try to read that whole chapter. But... As we're trying to put the pieces together for the nation of Israel, we have to um, we have to put each piece in its place, and that's all I'm trying to do. I can't just tell you about Israel. I can give you an overview, but what good is it if I don't show you the verses that you can go to and read it for yourself? So thus far, we've read Jeremiah 30 and Romans 11, and a few little pieces that that go along with that. But um, we're going to cover this phrase, the abomination that make it desolate, in relation to the nation of Israel. So, timeline. Let me give you a timeline, and again, we'll cover the passages that will fill in these blanks eventually. But the timeline you got is a seven-year period for tribulation. We call it the Great Tribulation. But the the actual tribulation portion of it, the trouble portion of it, is according to, if you look at Daniel's 70th week, again, I don't have time to run all these. I want to focus on Israel. That's what I'm trying to get you to see. We already know that the time of tribulation, that troublesome time, is relative to who? It's the time of whose trouble? Time of Jacob's trouble. So keep that in mind. The tribulation is not about the church. It's about refining Israel and turning them back to God the final time before He sets up that millennial kingdom. So the timeline goes something like this. The rapture takes place. Uh, I believe that there will be a three and a half year period of peace, peace when there is no peace. And then you have a three and a half years of great tribulation, which is trouble on this earth. And you'll read those judgments if you read uh, the book of Revelation. There's a lot of other passages in the Old Testament that go along with it. And then at the end of that time period, you'll have the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. After that, you'll have the thousand-year millennial reign. And we could, we could go from there. But I want to get the timeline set up for you 
so that you understand that the time we're talking about, uh, this time of the abomination of desolation. I told you, Daniel, put a mark there and go to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. And then we'll go back over there uh, to the book of Daniel and run this phrase. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, keep your marker there and Daniel will come back. 2 Thessalonians 2. Something interesting is stated here that gives us pieces of the puzzle. You say, why is this abomination of desolation so important? Well, here's the pieces of the puzzle. I want you to see this... Um, Antichrist and see the, the, the order kind of at the turning of that great tribulation. We'll see that time period all the way to the second coming. Again, the rapture and the second coming are two different events. We'll have to go through that. We've gone through that here before. Uh, one event is where we meet the Lord in the air. The other event, He's actually going to touch down on the ground. Ain't nobody meeting Him in the air. He's going to touch down on the ground. He's going to begin a thousand year reign here. And so you can see the, different, um, the difference between the two through the Scriptures. We'll, we'll, we've run it before. We, we will do it again. I'm sure within the next few years, cover this ground again. But look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto Him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, nor troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, neither by nor by letter, uh, as, uh, as from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for the, uh, that day shall not uh, come, except there be a falling away first, and a man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now let me say something to you. Um, again, I, I believe this is talking about the rapture. Um, and... The phrase that I keep hearing, and it's true, it's true, but it's also very deceptive, so you have to be very careful. The phrase I keep hearing from a lot of preachers is, there are no signs for the rapture. That is true. It's a fact. But, if you think prophecy does not indicate that this thing is winding down, and that we're getting close to that time, we can know that the times and the seasons. He said, I, I would not that you'd be ignorant. We can see it unfolding. So, though there may not be signs, because the Jews require a sign, those signs that you see in the Bible, the, the moon turning to blood and all this other stuff, that is not associated with the rapture. That's associated with the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That all is true. From a technical standpoint, it's true. But what I don't want you to see is God didn't leave us completely ignorant. He, he gave us a way to see that this thing is getting pretty close. Now, what you're going to have, I, I, and we'll, we'll begin to put all this picture together. The nation of Israel is going to believe that their Messiah has shown up. I believe the Antichrist will show up according to the passage we're fixing to read. And they're going to think that he's the, the Messiah, that's come, and what he's going to do halfway through that tribulation period, he's going to double cross them. And at that point, they're going to realize this is not the Messiah, this is the Antichrist that those Christian folks have been talking about for a long time, and we missed the boat. That's when they're going to get their eyes open about halfway through that tribulation period. Okay? Peace, peace, when there is no peace, and then all of a sudden, they're double-crossed. That's why you hear the two sides, don't you? One side you see, hear about Israel, peace, we want peace, we want a peace agreement. But on the other side, you also know they keep double-crossing them. So they're going to try to sell this peace plan to them, but they're going to be double-crossed when they finally bite at it. Notice what he says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there be, uh, come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, this is the Antichrist, or that is worship, so that he, uh, as God, sitteth in the temple, showing himself that he is God. Remember you not when I was yet with you, I told you these things. 
But now you know what withholdeth, that it might be revealed in his time. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until, until he be taken out of the way, until that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. If you want some references on that, Daniel 7 would be some good ones. And uh, you can see um, that destruction of the Antichrist and the beast and, and Satan himself in Revelation chapter number 20. So the Lord's going to consume them with the brightness of his coming. That second coming is going to set it all straight. Right at the end end of that tribulation period. Well, we'll get into that a little bit later. We'll get into Gog and Magog just for a little bit, uh, a little bit later. But let's, let's save that for another day. I'm going to run a rabbit trail. It's going to take me a while, so I don't want to get off task. He said, even him who shall, uh, his coming is after the working of Satan with all signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness and unrighteousness in, in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they may might be they all might be damned who believe the truth and had pleasure in unrighteousness. So a man says, "I'm going to get saved when, when the Lord comes back and, and, and rapture takes place, and, and the, or the second coming comes back. I'm going to get right." Well, according to that passage, you're not getting right. You're not going to get right if you knew the truth at that point, and you rejected the truth at that point you're going to be sent strong delusion by God Himself because of your rejection. Yeah, I believe this, this um, reference here, strong delusion that they may believe lies during the, yeah, the Great Tribulation time period. I believe that once they've rejected, we're out of here. Right? We're gone. We're raptured out of here. And I think there's a lot of people that keep saying, well, I'm going to get right after that. After You're not. The Bible says you're not. You're going to be sent strong delusion. Now, I believe there's some that won't be at the age of accountability that will be able to grow up in this time period and make a choice. And you're going to see the, the Jews are, are going to get their eyes open nationally during this time period. So it shows you the focus. How could God send them a strong delusion? Think about it for a minute. It shows you who the focus of the tribulation is about. Because how could God send them strong delusion that they believe a lie, and yet halfway through that tribulation period, there's a group of Jews that are going to get their eyes open. How, how, you see what I'm saying? The focus has to be nationally on it's turning away from that. We've seen the closure of the Gentiles, their time period, Romans 11. The fullness of the Gentiles is spoken of. They're done because we're at the state right now that Israel was before God rejected them. What's that? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think the focus is going to be the Gentiles. I believe there's going to be a strong delusion amongst the Jews until they see that Antichrist double cross them. We'll talk about that a little bit. That's what I'm going to talk about tonight, uh, or this afternoon, is this abomination that make it desolate. We can sit here and argue about what it is. Do they kill a pig in the temple? Or they, they, I mean, we can sit here and argue about that all day long. It don't really tell you what that abomination is. They're going to know it at the time. That's when they're going to get, he's going to defile that temple somehow. I don't, I don't know how that is, but he's going to defile it. And so, um, but we see here that the Antichrist, notice he's going to oppose and exalt himself Above all that is called God, verse 4, he's going to want worship, okay? To sit in a temple wanting worship. I don't know, uh, just like that whore that's in Revelation 17, she's got names of blasphemy. I, I don't know at what point that the Jews are going to realize this blasphemous other than this abomination that make it desolate that's set up. So we see the Antichrist here. We see the process of the Antichrist uh, double crossing the nation of Israel. Let's go look at this a little bit. Daniel chapter number 11. Let's put these pieces together. Daniel chapter number 11. We do know for sure, according to the book of Daniel and even some New Testament passages, we know that um, that Antichrist is going to defile that temple. Daniel chapter number 11. 
Let me get there, Ezekiel Daniel, chapter number 11. And you, you can actually read in Daniel chapter number 10, uh, 11, and 12, the context, especially in chapter 11, is speaking concerning the Antichrist. So you'll see that all the way through Daniel chapter number 11. Let's look at, just to kind of pick out some verses, look at um, verse number 30 speaks of a king, and no doubt this is talking about the Antichrist. For the ships of uh, Chittim shall come against him, therefore shall he be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So, uh, so shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute. Notice this, watch. They shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and they shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate, and <coughs> such as do wickedly against the covenant shall corrupt by flatteries, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploit. So, again, during this time period, uh, notice the people who do know their God at this point, <laughs> they're going to do exploits. I do not believe this exploitation is going to be a Gentile exploitation. It's going to be a Jewish exploit. Again, the church is raptured out. The Jews, the tribulation is about the Jews. Time of Jacob's trouble. What you're seeing right here is this Antichrist is going to come in and it shows you something. It talks about him not having the faith of his fathers. I believe personally, based on what he said in the book of Daniel, those comments that are made, I believe this is a Jew who forsakes the faith of his father. Again, it's always been about the Jews. What better Christ, Antichrist to have than a Jewish Antichrist? What better deception to have than a man who claims to be a Jew and then turns his back on the faith? So, again, every indication is, because it's talking about him doing away with the daily sacrifice. Would the Jew allow him in there for the daily sacrifice if he wasn't a Jew? Absolutely not. So, again, the indication here is that the Antichrist will be Jewish. I strongly believe, although I wouldn't stake my life on it, if you read in, in Zechariah, Several times he's referred to, if you want to look this phrase up, as the Assyrian. He's, he's referred to as the Assyrian. If you want to look that phrase up, you'll see that, that passages that also cover the Antichrist refer to him as Assyrian. So its indication is that he's of Jewish faith and he's going to be from that area of Assyria. So I, I wouldn't stake my life on the second part, but the, the first part I strongly believe he's going to be a Jew. I don't think so either. How would he deceive them if he wasn't a Jew? They're, who are they looking for for their Messiah? They're looking for somebody to come of the seed of David. That's why I believe personally he's going to have the real David reign. We talked about him being resurrected. The Bible uh, speaks about that. He's going to have the real David. We talked about that last week. Resurrected and sit on the throne. Because they're going to be deceived. They're looking for somebody out of the tribe of Judah. Right? They're looking for somebody of the seed of David. Because that's where this prophecy said the Messiah would come from. They've already missed him. But at this point, they're not going to know. That's why I, 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 have, I find it hard to believe. I've heard people say, well, he's going to be Muslim. I find it extremely hard to believe that any Jew will follow a Muslim. I, I find it hard to believe a Jew would follow a Christian. I find it hard to believe a Jew would follow an atheist. I'm just saying an Orthodox Jew. I have a, uh, it's hard for me to believe that. But it speaks of the faith of his father. It speaks of the daily sacrifice. Listen, no Muslim's going to be doing that. Listen, us Christians don't do that. <laughs> Where's your daily sacrifice? Are you bringing something to an altar and sacrificing it? No, you're not. Again, I really believe if you read carefully in the Scriptures, this Antichrist is going to be a Jew in some form and he's going to turn his back on the faith that he once had. But notice it's, um, or maybe he didn't have it to begin with, right? <laughs> because, listen, 
You want to see the anti, anti-type? He, listen, what's he called here? Look at this. This should ring some bells for you. Watch. Let's see. I forgot where it's at. Oh, man. Oh, man. It's probably right under my nose. Yeah, okay. And the king shall, shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above God, and shall speak marvelous things of the God of gods, and shall prosper till indignation be accomplished, and for that uh, that is determined shall be. Neither shall he regard the God, notice, the God of who? Do you see how that uh, strongly indicates that he's a Jew? And interestingly enough, here's the thing. The Antichrist... Over there in 2 Thessalonians, we see a reference of the son of perdition. Right? Do you know somebody else who was associated with the son of perdition? What was he? Was he not a Jew? I believe Judas is a type of the Antichrist. Just like Judas betrayed the Lord, so the Antichrist will be a traitor. Okay, and here he was, Judas amongst those disciples, and they had no idea. I believe this, notice he's going to use flatteries. He's going to be a smooth-tongued talker, um, be able to say the right words. But I want you to notice, focus on the fact that it says the abomination make a desolate. desolate. Go to chapter 12, chapter 12. Again... The focus of the great tribulation, look at verse number 1. And at that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. Who's the children of Daniel's people? Is it not the nation of Israel? Daniel's people is Israel. During the time of tribulation, you know what the Bible says? Michael's going to stand up, that angel is going to stand up in defense for the nation of Israel. Isn't it something what you don't find here in the book of Daniel is anything to do with the Gentiles and a church? Again, the focus during the tribulation, even in the Old Testament prophecies, is the nation of Israel. Sure. Sure. No, I, no I, I don't think nor desire the desire of women nor regard of any God. I, I, don't think, I don't think it's speaking of sexual necessarily, his sexual preference. It could be. He's a man of sin. I, okay, I, I kind of can see where somebody would stretch and give that. I think the biggest issue that you're going to see here, this is why a lot of people think he's Muslim because of the way the Muslims generally treat their women folk. And I think that what he's, what he's saying here, just as far as Paul the Apostle and some of the others, we see other people who were focused on ministry, right? They didn't have wives. Didn't have wives or any of that. I think his, his desire is going to be at the top, to be at the top. It's all about himself. He's not going to have time for any of the other junk. He'll regard no other man's religion or way. It's just going to be all about him and worshiping him. So, if you want to make it that he was homosexual, have at it. Have at it. I don't have enough pieces of the puzzle there to convince me he was homosexual. You know? I think what it is, people want something new. Remember the Athenians? Remember over there in Mars Hill? Remember uh, Acts chapter number 16? What was their problem? They wanted to tell or hear some new thing. And that's the way this world is. There's nothing new under the sun, but they want to hear something new and something better and something stronger and something faster and something. They want to hear some new thing. 
And I, I think sometimes people read the Bible, instead of just reading and get what they can get, they, they want to get, a, Alex, me and him talked about this one, they want to get a nugget. They want to get what they call a gold nugget, you know, something that nobody else is know, knows. I don't care about none of that. I don't care about none of that. I have a hard, hard time just understanding what I need to understand for daily life. You start getting so deep in this stuff, you forget the things that are at the surface that are obvious. And a lot of these people who can go deep, who get deep into angels and weird things and uh, angels having sex with, with women and all this, and I, although I believe, I believe very well that's the case in, in Genesis chapter number 6. But what happens is you get so deep that you miss the things that are obvious. There's some things in the Bible that are clear and obvious. You don't have to go dig up something. You don't have to look into what does the desire of women mean. Does it mean he's home? What's that? Magnify himself. That's right. And that's why you know that goes along with 2 Thessalonians 2. He's going to exalt himself. You know, remember who else had a problem with that? Lucifer. When he fell in Isaiah 14. You know who else had a problem with it? Do you remember the rich man? Who, who had his big barns all full? And he's going to tear them down and build bigger barns? You know what he says? I, 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 I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And that's the problem with mankind. That's the problem with the devil from the beginning. That's the problem with the Antichrist. So when you make life about yourself, guess who you're behaving like? You're behaving like Satan. Who, who, you're behaving like the Antichrist. Who wants to behave like them? That's it. Middle letter of Jim, too. <laughs> yeah, but your name's James, ain't it? There you go. You're good. No I in that. But uh, let's go to chapter number 11. It was a good question. Um, I don't have enough evidence. I've heard it, but I think sometimes people try to make it say something it doesn't say, you know. But, I mean, if you want to believe that, it ain't going to hurt my feelings. I'm not going to lose any sleep whether you think the Antichrist is homosexual. He's a wicked man. So if you want to throw that in there, I'm okay with that too. But let me ask you this. Would an Orthodox Jew accept a homosexual? An Orthodox Jew. They would not. They would not. So I have trouble with them accepting that. They wouldn't accept it. It's going to be somebody who's going to be able to deceive them. They, they're going to think he's one of them. Let's look at um, chapter number 11, uh, uh, 12, verse 11. Start at verse 10. He says, Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. From the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away. We just read it, right? And the abomination that maketh desolate set up. Now, honestly, I think it could be that image they put in there. It could be an idol. I think it's very possible. Remember the, the image of the beast that's going to be there in Revelation? I think it's very possible. I've heard all kind of theories on this. Man has had a problem with it, haven't he? Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? What did they do? Nebuchadnezzar set up an image. It's almost identical to the image of the beast. You got the beast and you got an image that they set up of the beast. And so you had it with Nebuchadnezzar. He put an image of himself up. He told them, if you don't fall down and worship, you're going to be put to death. So I think it's possible. I, I lean that direction. I've heard all kind of... Uh, conjecture about it, you know, could be uh, sacrificing pig's blood. and all. I'm like, what in the world? Where did you get this from? I think that the strongest case from the scriptures is they're going to set up some kind of idol in there of some sort. It could be that beast that we see in the image of that beast that's there that they start realizing this is not true. The abomination of death that make a desolate set up, there shall be 1,290 days. 1,290 days. Somebody do some math for me, will you? 1,290 days divided by 
3.5. You can do it. You got, if you borrow everybody's fingers and toes, you can do it. Okay. Listen. So, 368 is what you got. So, approximately three and a half years. Whenever this time period is right here, it's halfway through the tribulation when they're going to be double-crossed. Do you see that? That's kind of where we get it from. It's going to be halfway through, three and a half years in. Okay? What is 1,000, let's see, what is it here? What is 1,200... And 90 days divided by 365. Is that roughly three and a half? Okay. So there you go. Three and a half years. Three and a half years. They do do 360. They do 360, which, like I said, the extra days. Again, they have to. Now, I will say this. You do know, and that's why we do 365. They do on a moon cycle, we do on a solar cycle, right? So they have to add days to their calendar. You do know that every so, so often on the years, they'll have to add days to their calendar to fill that calendar. So it's not, otherwise the seasons would be off for them, right? So I didn't know if you guys were aware of that, but they do that every so often. They'll make up some days, so... Again, 365 is going to be the average. It's going to be closer. 364, 365 is going to be closer to the real number that we're going to see, okay? But that's where we get that it's going to be three and a half years in. It's going to be three and a half years into the tribulation. That's when the Antichrist is going to double cross the nation of Israel. That abomination is going to be set up. That's when they're going to realize this is not the Antichrist, okay? So, we see the world's preparing for this time period, okay? If you want to read chapter 10, 11, 12 of Daniel, you can get the, the fuller picture, and you can understand that that king that's mentioned in chapter 10 is the Antichrist, okay? So, with that in mind, let's go to Matthew chapter 24. So, we see this abomination of to make it desolate, and it helps us in Matthew 24 understand some of the timeline that's going on here. Um, I think we make the Bible more difficult than what it is sometimes. If you just use a, a little bit of a common sense and come to it trying to understand the basics instead of trying to get some deep stuff, what happens is if you read it through every year, you'll get a piece of the puzzle this year, a piece of the puzzle next year. I didn't understand any of this the first 10 years. I, I was a big fog to me. I was taught what was right, and I knew right, the right words to say to people. But it wasn't until I studied it over and over that I started being able to put the pieces of the puzzle together for myself that I understood, okay, this is what's going to happen. Here's the verses that support it. So it, it takes some time and study, um, and the pieces will fall in. That, all I'm trying to do is give you the verses to go to so that you can put the pieces together, especially concerning the nation of Israel. Let's look at um, this, um, chapter 24, look at verse number 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, and I've warned some folks before and instructed folks before on this, what are they asking him? How many questions are asked here? Tell us what shall be, uh, when shall these things be, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? How many questions did they ask him? Three questions. So as you read through Matthew 24, you have to ask yourself, <coughs> is he talking about when these things shall be? Is he talking about what shall be the sign of thy coming? Or is he talking about when the end of the world is? That's the three things he talks about in this passage. Jesus answered and said unto him, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Now, let me say something about this. 
There's two ways to look at that passage, isn't there? Would you agree there's two ways to look at that passage? It could be an antichrist who's coming in the name of Christ and saying that he's Jesus Christ. Or it could be a preacher saying, I'm coming in the name of Jesus Christ and still deceive you. There's two ways to look at it. So he could, they could physically come in Jesus' name and profess to be a follower of Jesus, or they could profess literally to be Jesus. Two ways to look at that passage. Notice what he says here. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these thing, uh, things must come to pass, yet uh, the end is not yet. Now watch, let me say something to you. People say, well, wars and rumors of war, that's always been so. Do you know why? And there, that's true, but do you know why? You know what's helped us understand that there has been wars and rumors of wars that we otherwise would not have known about? Technology. Technology has advanced our knowledge of the fact that there is wars going on. We can know instantly, and we know every little skirmish that goes on now. So it's, it may not be that necessarily that there's more wars and rumors of war. It's the fact that we know more about it now. We hear more about it. So either way, the Word of God's true. You see that? Because I've had people say, well, there's always been wars or rumors, but not to the point where we know about them the way we know about them now. Notice there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. How would there be a rumor of war? How would we even know if there wasn't such technology to feed us? I mean, we knew before Russia went into Ukraine that it was fixing to happen, didn't we? That's a rumor of war. It's a rumor of war. Notice what it says, For a nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, and pestilence, and earthquakes, in divers places. I watched a video not too long ago about some of these natural disasters. I, there's a guy who has been documented, I, I don't know if he's a Christian or not, but he definitely warns people about the end times. And you know what he does? He documents floods with dates. He documents all the earthquakes with dates and shows you how that it's incredible how many happen worldwide. Some of them are not reported on the news. How often it happens in our generation. Now, it doesn't mean necessarily that it's happening more. It means that we know more about it now. You understand? You can look at it two ways. Notice this. He says, and they shall be, deliver you up to be afflicted, verse 9, and shall kill you. Who are they going to deliver up to be afflicted? Alright, in case you didn't know, let's finish reading. <laughs> Context is very important. Is it going to be the church? Ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Now who does he use that phrase with often in the Old Testament? The nation of Israel. Watch. Then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise, and shall deceive many. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. That's where we're at. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. This is not, for by grace are you saved through faith. It's a different kind of salvation. It's talking about a deliverance of a nation, the nation of Israel. Saved, if you read the book of Daniel in chapter 12, that saved is replaced with delivered. They're delivered by their Savior when He comes back. If they make it to the end of that tri tribulation, they're going to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Okay? Watch this. But he, he that endures to the end shall be saved. This same gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness <coughs> to all nations. Then shall the end come. Now watch, verse 15. Then, uh, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the pro uh, Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Look at the parentheses. Whosoever, uh, whoso readeth, let him understand. You know why we went to Daniel and I showed you the passages on the abomination of desolation? Because right here in Matthew, he's talking about the end time. <coughs> he's talking about the tribulation period that's going to be there, a great tribulation. He's fixing to mention it. And he's warning. 
But I want you to notice, he is not warning Gentile-run uh, church members. I want you to notice, the context will show you this is the nation of Israel he's talking about. Watch. Verse 6. Then let him which be in Judea flee to the mountains. Who would be in Judea? Yes, ma'am. What's that? I believe it's Jerusalem, personally. Oh, right. I have no idea, but I think what you, what you find is them hiding in the mountains. You find them hiding. Hmm. Right, right. Yeah, I think, I think it, yeah, it's the same area. Same area. He's, but what I'm trying to emphasize is the focus, which a lot of people miss, is not on church. The church is gone. Over and over, you see, that's, that's how you know there's something that takes place before any of this happens, because he doesn't mention church. In, look, you go from chapter number 4 in the book of Revelation why does John mention church chapter 1, church chapter 2, church chapter 3, and then you don't hear a single thing about the church from chapter 4 on? He says, come up hither, that's it. That's it. Don't you think that's kind of peculiar? Why would he start off focusing on the church, come up hither, and then all of a sudden the whole focus of the tribulation is the Jews? It's because it's the time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 30. So I think what a lot of people miss is, look at the context, verse 16. Let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. That's where they're going to flee to. They'll flee into the mountains. Watch this. Let them that, uh, him which is on the housetop not come down and take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back and take his clothes. Woe unto them that are with child and give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in winter. Now watch. Neither on the Sabbath day. Listen. Short of the seven day Adventists who got it all wrong. What Gentile cares about the Sabbath day? The Sabbath was a, Jew, a sign between the nation of Israel and God. And he says that two or three times in the Old Testament. That's why we don't, we're not under a Sabbath. It does not mean that these feasts and these Sabbaths are not going to be kept during the millennial reign. They're going to be kept. Why? Because the focus is on the nation of Israel. He promised a kingdom where He would rule and reign, and God is going to keep His promise. So yeah, there will be feast days that will be reinstituted. We see that in the Old Testament. And the Gentiles will be forced to be uh, come to those feasts. They're not going to be, listen, they're not going to be, uh, uh, they'll be worldwide feasts. They, it, the Bible speaks of them flowing into the, uh, the, nation, uh, the nation of Israel, flowing into Jerusalem. But the only thing is, there's going to be one ruler that's going to matter in that day. There ain't going to be multiple rulers. It's going to be Christ, the head of all nations. And he's going to rule with a rod of iron. Look what he says here. Notice the, the mention of the Sabbath shows you who it's for. For there shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. Notice, saved is not for by grace, so you save through faith again. 
Saved means they're alive. For the elect's sake, these days shall be shortened. Elect. Who's that? The church? Again, who is this great tribulation about? The nation of Israel. You cannot get away from it. Over and over in the Scriptures, He makes that very clear. It's not about you and me. Uh, it's about the nation of Israel. He says, Then if any man say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Now you know this is before the, the millennial period. How do you know? Who's going to reign during the millennial reign? You know this junk ain't going to be going on during that time period. It's got to be before that. Behold, I've told you before, therefore if, ye shall, uh, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he's in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Interesting. Verse 28. For wheresoever the carcass is, there shall the eagles be gathered. What does that mean? You know what Jesus said? This is my body, which is broken for you. He said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you'll have no part in me. Now, he's not talking about going and gobbling him up physically, but if you look at this, these eagles, wheresoever the carcass is, it's, it's a reference in, in regard to Jesus gathering everybody to himself. Wheresoever the carcass is, there, he says we're going to mount up on wings as an eagle, didn't he? When it's when in regard to the righteous, he's talking about the gathering of his people unto himself. And again, the context is who is he gathering this time? Who is he gathering? The nation of Israel. That's what we've talked about through the whole thing. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, so right at the end, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven the powers of heaven shall be shaken and it shall appear uh, then shall appear the sign of, uh, of the Son of Man in heaven then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in clouds of heaven with power and great glory and then shall he send his angels with a great tr uh, sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds uh, from one end of the uh, heaven to another, and he goes on, and so on and so forth. But what I want you to see is that abomination that's, that make us desolate is mentioned here once again. And surrounded, Daniel talks about Michael standing up for the children of Daniel's people, the nation of Israel. Surrounded by this abomination that make us desolate on both sides, the focus is on what nation? So, if the Bible puts the focus on one nation, this is why as Christians, although we, the Bible says they're enemy, enemies for the gospel's sake, that don't mean that we treat them, uh, we, we go and try to mow them down and we stand against them. What it means is that they stand in opposition to the true Messiah, which they've missed currently. They're elect for the Father's sake. There's coming a time, I'm telling you, when the focus is going to be on that nation and he gives us commandment. You know what he says in the Old Testament? There were some nations that were speaking against the nation of Israel. And you know what he said? You know what I'm going to do? I judge them. I set them straight. But when I'm done with them, if you're not careful before I'm done with them, I'm going to turn and what I was going to do to them, I'm going to leave them alone and I'm going to turn and I'm going to do it to you if you don't leave them alone. That's what he said. So you've got to be very careful in, in your attitude toward them. I particularly don't care about their stance against the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
they're wrong. The scripture says they're wrong. There's some of them that are still saved because they weren't all cut out as we saw in Romans 11. But let me say this. From a scriptural standpoint, this dog that has eaten scraps from the master's table wouldn't dare speak about the children of that master because it's very possible that the children of that master might drop me a crumb. It's amazing how we, we get high-minded as Gentiles and you see this movement, this hatred of Israel movement in independent Baptist churches. I don't believe they're Bible-believing. I won't call them Bible-believers because I don't believe they believe, believe the Bible. But in independent Baptist churches, there are people who are anti-Israel. That's a fact. And it used not to be the case. They believe that the church has replaced the nation of Israel. And you will never replace that nation. Never replace it. That Valley of Dry Bones, next week, Lord willing, we're going to begin and talk there. The Valley of Dry Bones, read Ezekiel 37, 38, and 39. That's homework for next week because we're going to discuss those passages. I may not have time to read all of them, so I may have to just read through certain portions. So as you read chapter Ezekiel 38, um, pay attention to that word evermore. Because that's how you know it's a future event. It's not an event that's already taken place. In chapter number 38, he's going to say the latter times, so you know it's the end times. Chapter 37 ties into all of that. It's going to show how he's going to resurrect that nation out of the dust, which he has already done. And so we'll start covering the focus on that. Now, is there anything that we've discussed today that, people don't understand that's that's here that you want to ask a question about y'all got the basic timeline does the does it that's right Genesis chapter 12 I think it's down around verse 3 or 4 isn't it one is it one but hopefully we'll put the pieces together a little bit at a time we're getting there uh, hopefully it's a little more clear for some of you um Next week, Alpha is going to give us a report about this clay city because I, I have no idea what you're talking about. I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to see it. I want to make sure it ain't Roman Catholic or Mormon. Oh, did she? Okay, I, I definitely would like, I'm interested to hear that, because that's the first I heard of it. Now I got homework, so that's why I was teasing you. <laughs> that's why I was teasing you. But um, I, I do, believe it or not, you guys bring up things I don't know, I go home and study. That's the only way to know the answers. What's that? Yeah. Well, we, we're going to try to stay on this trail, our, the study of Israel. I hope it's helping you, putting the piece together. Um, it definitely has helped me, and it took me a long time. I don't know about y'all, I'm, I'm not the brightest bulb in the pack. It, it took me about 10 years being saved before I even got a grasp on any of this. Now, some people are just very smart, and they get it quick, but it took me a long time to put all these pieces together. And I was told, I went to Bible school, and I was told, just this verse, this verse, this verse, and I just could not get it. It took years of reading before I started to finally, you know, what, what's the order here? What, the, my biggest thing, my biggest thing that was hard for me to see in the beginning was the rapture and the second coming are two different events? I had a hard time with that starting out. Like, because you read and they all, they, they're similar, seem similar. But then you read it a little while, you start realizing, nah, these are different. These are not the same. One, he's coming in clouds, and the other, he's touching down on the Mount of Olives. They're not the same. Not the same. All right, let's stand for prayer. <clears throat>